So I'm going to talk about uh, Partition Global Address Based Languages, or PGAS languages, as they're called. Um, I guess the official title of my talk is UPC, and you will see that UPC is one of the words in that much longer title. Um, so I will talk about UPC. But I'm also going to try to give you um, a flavor, a little bit, of, about UPC++, which is a language we're in the middle of developing. Um, so I'll, I'll say you know, a little bit about that. Before I do that, I want to talk a little bit about NERSC. I think some of you have um, accounts at NERSC. How many of you have accounts at NERSC? Is there anybody? OK. So um, you know, a little bit about NERSC, because you've probably heard about some of the other centers already. Um, we've got lots of users, 5,000 users. Uh, who write lots of papers um, doing it with all kinds of great work that gets done at NERSC. We're actually in our 40th year of operation um, at NERSC, so we're celebrating our 40th uh, anniversary. Um, we had a series of Nobel laureates who've all computed at NERSC um, giving talks, and uh, you can look at their lectures. You can stream them if you want to by going to the NERSC webpage and look for the Nobel laureate lectures uh, for the NERSC 40, 40th anniversary. We have big, huge supercomputers. We actually have two Cray machines. Uh, Brad mentioned Ho had a picture of Hopper on the slide, but uh, we also have Edison, which is an XC30, and you'll have access to both of those if you have a NERSC account. So um, what is this PGAS idea about? Um, you, you have heard it kind of referred to in, in Brad's talk, but I thought I would go back and just try to explain kind of where this idea came from and why it exists. Um, so uh, on the left-hand side, you have kind of a traditional message passing programming cartoon of what a, a program might look like in an MPI bulk synchronous style program. So what do you do? You've got some kind of a physical domain you're simulating. You divide that domain up into pieces. Maybe it's a really simple thing, like you're just doing Laplace on a 2D mesh, and you just chop it up into, into sub-blocks. Or it's something really complicated, like an unstructured grid, and you need to chop it up by calling a graph partitioner. But in any case, you figure out some way of chopping it up into roughly equal sized pieces. Um, and then you just have the program compute on one piece, exchange some information about what's happening at the boundaries, um, maybe do some global operations every once in a while, like a global FFT or whatever, and then repeat. Um, and uh, that, that works actually pretty well for a problem that can be subdivided like that, and where a lot of the communication is going to be uh, nearest neighbor communication, but most importantly, where you can actually predict in advance how long things are going to take. In a global address space programming model, the kind of cartoon of what a program looks like is all these threads start computing, and they grab whatever data they need whenever they need it, wherever it sits across the machine. OK, so um, it's very different. One of the things it means is that you don't have to know where to put the receive operations. OK, if you think about it in a send and receive style, at some point you need to figure out where to put the receive for the send that's coming in. Whereas in a global address space style, you can go off and just write some data remotely without the other side, the other program on the other side being involved in that. And um, the same thing is true if you're going to do a remote read. So. Um, and by the way, about 10% of the NERSC applications use some kind of a PGAS-like model, which includes um, things like NAMD. It also includes um, th you know, other, other kinds of library-based PGAS models um, in addition to um, languages. So, so these are used in um, large-scale applications. Um, the, uh, the UPC language that I'll start by uh, talking about is more commonly used um, outside of DOE, but in other, um, in other organizations that have these kind of data analysis sort of applications that do random, random accesses into memory. So to kind of summarize the, um, the advantages and disadvantages, and I won't read through this slide. There's a lot of, there's a lot of text here. And um, there's, I put more slides online than I'll probably have a chance to talk to. But basically, shared memory is a fairly convenient programming model. You can build these large, complex shared data structures, um, but you have no locality control. And what PGAS really gives you is the convenience of shared memory programming um, with locality control, which gives you scalability. So um, here's my picture of what a PGAS language looks like. Um, I think Brad showed something kind of similar to this. Um, what makes a PGAS language a PGAS language? Well, first of all, it has to have a global address space. So a global address space, we use that term rather than shared address space or, sh or shared memory, um, because with shared memory, you think of uh, like a cache coherent a shared memory multiprocessor, multi-core, or even a, a multi-socket shared memory multiprocessor. A global address space says that you can access thing any, anything anywhere, but doesn't say anything about how fast it will be. And the partition impact, uh, 
partitioned um, characteristic of a PGAS language as opposed to just gas or shared memory is that um, the data is designated as being local or global. So there's some way in which, like in a message passing program, you're going to divide up your data structures into different kind of chunks, um, say do, do domain decomposition, and you're going to carefully lay those out across the processors. The difference is that you don't have to ask the other processor, the program on the other processor, to send you some data if you need it. You can just go and read that data directly. Now, the other thing about at least the um, UPC and UPC++ languages that I'll talk about is that there's a, also a split between um, the private part of the address space, which is down here in the white, and the shared part of the address space, which are all the data structures that are accessible. So not every variable is accessible. Um, and one of the reasons for this is because um, you can think of your the variables in the private region as things like stack variables. Okay, so if you've got you've got a function you've just called and it's sitting on the program stack and um, it's got some variables inside of it, and you some processor has a pointer into that to that variable, and that function returns that variable is gone, and so it's not a very useful way of programming. And so um, you if you if you you want something to be accessible to other um, other processors, you put it in the shared part of the space, and you'll do that by doing something like a dynamic memory allocation or um, putting it in the static scope in a language like C or, U or C++. Okay, so one final kind of bit of uh, motivation is to think about the way I really think about um, kind of the differences between some of these different languages um, is how well they support irregular computation and. If, you, if I look back on um, what people think about both in modeling and simulation applications, what's easy, what's hard, and also looking forward to some of these very large data analysis applications that are looking at scientific data, um, I hear two things from the people talking about, say, big data in scientific applications. The first one is, oh, those applications are completely trivial from a parallelism perspective. We can run them on any old machine, and we don't need a supercomputer. And I, that's re re reflected by the left-hand um, image there, which is a picture of the Large Hadron Collider. And indeed, the data analysis or the LHC is done by spreading out computation all over the world. Okay, um, It's a bunch of massively independent jobs, um, and they're just farmed out to machines all over the world at different universities, at different centers, and so on. We run some of them at NERSC um, on some of the smaller clusters, and they're, and they're completely independent of each other. Um, now, in simulation, which are the, kind of the two middle things, and I think they're a little bit harder. So you've got nearest neighbor simulations, and those are certainly harder um, and require a faster network than something like um, this, this independent data analysis. And then you have problems that require some kind of global computation, like a 3D FFT or something where you're doing an all-to-all, -all, even something with lots of reductions, and it's going to have going to require a much um, higher speed network. And the hardest thing is on the right to support from a parallelism standpoint in terms of an architect you say, OK, here's what I want to do. I want to do random access in a lar very, large very large memory space. And they say, well, if you want a very large memory space, I can't make it shared because I can't get this, the large enough amount of memory into a single memory space and make it cache coherent. So I'll make it distributed. And now you've got to, act you've got to have that kind of um, uh, some kind of support for doing random access. So that's sort of the hardest one of those. And UPC really came from this idea. One of the canonical UPC benchmarks is a benchmark called GUPS. I'll show you a little um, data on that. But basically, it's doing a random fetch and increment to a variable in a huge array. Um, think about building a large distributed hash table, and that one will come up as well later. Um, it turns out that we also found that UPC is really nice for getting, really using the best um, network ava performance available for doing something like an all-to-all -all computation, where you really want to move a lot of data around the network. It's not so much about convenience in that case. It's really about just kind of getting at the lowest level layers of the network. OK, so I'm now going to do a tutorial on UPC for probably about 10 or 15 minutes. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit more about um, some of the kind of higher level ideas and what you might want to look at um, going forward, and also talk about some real applications in UPC and then UPC++. So the first thing you should know is that any C program is a legal UPC program. If you compile it and run it, um, it'll just run P copies of it. So it's a single program, multiple data model, um, similar to, uh, and I have to be careful here because I've got Rusty and others in the audience, but careful to the kind of traditional style of an MPI application, right? You just get, you've got your main function. And when Brad said, oh, my main function, that's going to run on uh, domain, is it, whatever it's called, locale, locale zero, locale zero, um, that uh, um, in, in, uh, UPC, it doesn't run on a single one. It runs on all of them simultaneously. So what does Hello World do? It's just going to print out, you know, hello from every one of the threads um, together. 
whether or not this you know, gives you a bunch of text all garbled together or actually has a bunch of print statements that come out in an arbitrary order uh, depends on the implementation of your printf, but anyway, and, and what, what, how that works. OK, so let's do a little bit more interesting example. So that's, that's kind of silly to, to use a bunch of processors to compute the same thing. Um, let's use a bunch of processors to compute something that um, has a little bit of randomness in there so we can get, gain more confidence in our answer, so kind of a Monte Carlo calculation of pi. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to throw darts. I'm going to compute, estimate pi. I'm going to throw darts at the unit square. I'm going to figure out that I um, use you know, some basic formulas I know about the area of a square and the area of, of a quadrant of, the, uh, uh, of a unit circle. And um, for, I'm going to th throw randomly to compute a value of x and a value of y, and then figure out whether x squared plus y squared is less than 1, and which means it's in the red part of the space, otherwise it's in the white, uh, otherwise it's in the white part of the space, and then they can compute the ratio of the um, fractions of darts that hit in the red space. So a really simple um, kind of uh, program that will work. And, and it's embarrassingly parallel, so um, it, won't be, it won't be too interesting, except um, it will, we'll still get to see some of the interesting features of UPC. So first of all, we can write a serial program that's a completely independent estimates of pi, kind of wasting our parallel machine by doing this exactly the same thing over and over again. Um, but here's just the code. And I'm not going to walk through this um, in detail, except um, just to kind of give you a, an idea of what's, what's in the program. I've got some variables here, which is trials is the number of times I'm throwing a dart, and hits is the number of times that it hits inside of the, um, the unit uh, circle, so in, in the red, red region. So you know, I've got a little bit of input. If you're familiar with C, this all looks kind of normal to you. If you're not, this looks completely atrocious. Um, uh, you have a random number generator you're going to use. Now, we're seeding that with um, different threads, so we're actually going to get a slightly different, uh, we're probably going to get a different result on each process because we're using a different random number seed. Um, but we're, we're, we're doing this um, calculation independently, and all of them are going to print out their own estimates of pi. So OK, we might see slightly different values of pi, but nothing very um, helpful from that. OK, and there's a little bit of helper function code in here, which you can go and If you want to actually write this code, you can, you can type this in. This is just the thing that's calculating whether or not x squared plus y squared is less than 1 and does the random number uh, calculation and so on. OK. So we need some more interesting data structures because right now all we can do is we can start a bunch of threads and they run independently. We need to have some way of communicating between them. And the standard way of doing that in UPC is through the global address space, although we will see that there are other ways as well. So what, what do we do? We have the ability to declare a variable that's sitting up here in the shared address space. The easiest way to do this is by just putting the keyword shared in front of the declaration of that variable. So I have a variable called ours. Um, it's declared as shared. And I have another variable called mine. Uh, that's not declared as shared. And you can see from the picture below that the ours variable goes on thread 0 in that domain, kind of like Brad, uh, Brad's uh, locale. Um, and um, every thread has its own copy of the mine variable, OK? And so um, you have to keep that in mind, that they all have their independent copies. There's no one, no, nothing magical in the UPC implementation or in the hardware making sure that all those mine variables have the same value. They have whatever that value they have based on whatever computation is going on in that particular thread. Um, the ours variable only lives in one place. So there's no cache coherence problem, because you, no other processor will cache that value. And so that's why you get scalability. What you get, or, or you can get scalability, because you can control the layout. What you have to be very careful about is you don't want a lot of threads accessing the variable ours, or it's going to be very slow, right? Because there's going to be a lot of communication as they go out across the network to get the variable ours. OK, so let's um, use this basic idea um, to build a, a version of the, of the Pi program um, that, will, um, that will just take advantage of shared variables. So the only kind of significant change I'm going to make here is I'm going to put the um, uh, hits variable, I'm going to make it shared, because they're all going to accumulate now into the hits. And I'll increase my confidence and my estimate, improve the estimate of the value of Pi um, by having all the processors throw dar darts independently. Um, but then kind of adding the results together. So I have to have some way of dividing up the work. There's a little bit of arithmetic in here to figure out how many, time, how many darts do you want to throw. And based on that, how many um, darts will each one of the threads throw. Um, kind of grungy stuff in there. Then I, I call my hit function um, in, on each processor. Remember, this code is running independently on in each one of my threads. And um, it's going to go through some number of trials, which is the number of trials it's get. They're, they're almost all going to run the same number of trials, unless there's a little bit of, unless the uh, no, total number is not a multiple of the number of processors. They call the hit thing and accumulate in the number of darts of theirs that hits inside the red region. 
Then there's a UPC barrier, so there's a synchronization construct just like in MPI, and, um, and then you print out um, the, the re result. If, um, if my thread is zero, then, um, th my, then thread zero will print out something that just says, um, here's, the, here's the estimate of the value of pi. Okay, what's wrong with this program? There's a race condition, exactly. So there's a race condition because um, all these threads are incrementing the hits variable at the same time. Um, any other problems with the program besides getting the wrong answer? That's right. So it's, um, it's getting the wrong answer, and it's really, really slow. So OK, um, other than that, it's kind of a nice shared memory PGAS program. OK, so let's, um, let's throw a little bit of synchronization into it and see if we can make the program better. Um, you've already seen the barrier construct. U UPC also has a notion of split phase barriers, which means you may think it's kind of odd to think of a barrier as something that's split phase. But what it means is um, UPC notify says, I'm ready for the barrier. You know, let me know when everybody else is ready. And UPC wait says, I really need everybody else to be ready for the barrier, and I'm going to sit here and wait until everybody else is through the barrier. So what you can do with a split phase barrier is, let's say that you've got some kind of a halo exchange, and let's, we'll do the Laplacian example. And you say, well, um, I'm going to go and calculate my boundary region first. And, um, and then I, so I calculate that, and I write the variables, and everybody's going to read from that when they're, when they're ready. And so I say UPC notify, meaning my boundary area is ready for everybody else to read. Now I'll go calculate the interior, which doesn't require anything from anybody else. And then, and then I'll do a wait at the end. And hopefully by the time I get to the wait at the end, everybody else will at least have filled in their barriers. So you can, in this way, get a little bit out of phase, um, out of sync with the other processors, and deal with some of the kind of um, perturbations in performance that you might see. UPC also has locks. So if you're writing a shared memory style program, um, you're, going to, you're going to want to use these locks. I didn't put all of the details of what the lock specification look like here, but basically they look like standard locks. You allocate them, you free them, you lock them, and you unlock them. And so here's what the Pi example looks like in a shared memory style. So there's our sh shared hits variable again. Um, and let's see. We, the, um, we're going to allocate a lock in this particular case that we didn't have before. And we still accumulate locally. Oh, so, so we're going to eliminate the performance bottleneck that we had in the previous shared memory version. Instead of having all of the threads at, writing into the shared hits variable every time they throw a dart, they're going to have their own local private variable called my hits, and they'll update that my hits variable. Um, so now they're going to get much better locality of that access. And then when they actually are done with all of their darts, they just have to do one addition into the shared variable, and they do that with a lock. Um, so you call, um, you, you uh, lock the hit lock, and then you um, increment the hits variable, and then you unlock it. So you accumulate it in this way across the threads. So this is a shared memory style. Yes? How does that stop the hits from being accessed if the lock is not associated with the variable? Um, so the lock is um, is only is associated with the variable kind of in the programmer's mind in the sense that there is only one lock. Okay, so when you um, the way to think about the picture is you know both hits and um, lock. What is it called? Um, hit lock sit on thread zero. Okay, um, but it's a UPC lock T, which is which is a, a shared type. Yeah, no, that's that's that wasn't isn't obvious from the syntax at all. So, um, so now this version gets the right answer, and it actually runs pretty well on a modest number of processor cores, um, but it's not really scalable. If we want to run it on um, 100,000 cores or something like that, um, the problem is going to be down here in this critical region. You're going to have a bunch of threads trying to lock, and there's going to be a lot of contention for that lock and things like that. So, what are we going to do to make that that addition more scalable? We want to add a bunch of numbers together, one per processor. Reduction, exactly. OK, so UPC has collectives. And so you've seen a shared memory style in UPC. This is what I'll call a data parallel style in UPC, kind of in the same spirit as in, um, in Chapel, although maybe a little bit less, less data parallel than that, because we're going to be doing things kind of still based on the threads in the program. 
So here's, there, there's a, um, a much larger collectives interface, and I don't want to try to go through all of the details of that here, but you can certainly look at that online. Um, but here's what the code looks like in, written in a kind of data parallel style, where once again, you're doing a bunch of independent updates of, hits, of my hits variables, and then rather than um, asynchronously adding to something by acquiring a lock, you just have a reduce operation. And the reduction then collects all the hit results together and threads your prints out the answer. Okay, this particular interface, um, I asked the, the Berkeley team to build um, a, many years ago when we were teaching an introductory programming course and our, the collective library that we have in UPC is actually fairly extensive and fairly complex, as is the MPI collective library. And I said, well, if I, all I want to do is collect together a set of scalar variables, one, one per processor, can't we do something simpler? And so this is called the, um, the uh, value-based collective. So when you only want to do a collective, uh, like a reduction or a broadcast on a single scalar variable, then you can use this simplified interface, which is available uh, and runs on top of any UPC compiler. Okay, now the next way that we could do this is um, we could use arrays, okay? So um, we're not quite done with the pi example yet. What do, what do shared arrays look like in UPC? Um, well, first of all, the, the scalars, as you saw, have already uh, always live on thread zero, but if you have an array, that's gonna be actually spread out over the threads, if, if you've got a shared array, that is. So there's just a couple of, a, a few examples here. If we've got an array X, that has a number of elements equal to the number of threads, um, you, then the picture of X there shows that the blue square is the one, the blue element is the one that lives on thread zero, and they're just cyclically mapped around. And if you have a multidimensional array, the way to think about this is in C, multidimensional arrays are fairly weak, actually, and so you can't do nice things like slicing and, um, and sub, you know, taking different kinds of um, subdomains and things like that of the arrays. Um, it's really easiest to think of a C array, even when it's a multidimensional array, as a big flat section of memory, and that's, that thing is going to get mapped cyclically around. So if you have an array that's three by threads, um, the first element of each one of those chunks of four, um, which is the number of threads in this particular example, is going to be on thread zero. So this actually is a column-oriented layout of the array because you have just declared it in just exactly the right way. Um, and if you have but though something that doesn't divide, like you've got a three by three array on four threads, then you're gonna get kind of this weird pattern of different elements belonging to the different number of threads. So you have to really think about your, your data layout when you're going to use these. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you how to use um, a simple array like this. The first example there of X comes up very frequently in UPC programs. Multidimensional arrays in UPC um, and all of the applications that we've written, they tend to you, as soon as you get past anything besides like Laplacian, you want a much more sophisticated data structure. And I'll tell you what that looks like in a couple minutes. Okay, so here's the share, shared, uh, shared array version of um, the HITS program. And each thread is going to be inc incrementing to separate counter, but those counters are all gonna sit inside of a shared array. So rather than um, it, declaring this my hits variable, instead I'll declare a, an all hits variable, which has one element per thread, so it's an array of size threads. And, um, and then inside of my, my increment statement, or when I'm, when I'm throwing darts and I, I call the hit function, um, I'll just at increment the element that's sitting at all hits of my thread array. Now, for those of you who worry about hardware performance and stuff like this, it's important to remember each one of those elements is sitting on a different processor's memory. On a distributed memory machine, this actually works really well. On a shared memory machine, they may be sitting next to each other on a cache line, although that depends on the details of the UPC implementation. Usually we actually get pretty good locality out of that as well. So the, they're actually, you know, each element is actually associated with a thread that's incrementing it. And then, um, well, then at the end, one thread, in this particular case, we're just having thread zero, run through the array and add everything up. And hopefully, yes, I do have my barrier in there to make sure everybody is done with the increments before you do the addition. So this is also a non-scalable version of the increment, similar to the one that we saw with the, um, with the uh, um, lock around it. Um, but it was, um, but it's still, um, it will, it's probably per, will perform better than that one because at least you don't have locks around the, the variables and when you're doing these, you just have one thread that's running through. There, so there's a little bit of serial code here, which is gonna be faster than having a whole bunch of threads trying to access a lock and increment a variable, which will end up being serial, um, but it will still be, uh, but not as fast, not as scalable as one that's using reductions. 
Okay, so um, what about more interesting kinds of data structures? Well, um, in, in C, you have things like malloc that you use for irregular data structures. And um, in UPC, you have the analogous versions, UPC, alloc. Um, and so you can allocate a bunch of data sitting inside of the global address space. And so you can use the regular malloc, and that'll put things in your private address space. So not just stack variables, but also heap variables that are allocated with malloc will end up in your in your private address space. But your um, but uh, in addition, then if you want to put things in the shared address space, you can do that with UPC alloc. Um, and there's both a collective and a non-collective version of that. Um, and that is all the prostors doing it together to get something kind of a big shared thing that's spread out over all the threads or just one object that's sitting in your local, the local piece of the shared address space. And there's, then you have to free this, this um, data up as well. So um, how do you actually, well, how do we build real arrays for any kind of non-trivial um, program and this is really useful because um, you, you may a lot of applications have much more complex data structures like adaptive meshes that have a hierarchy of blocks um, or other kinds of um, unstructured meshes or even if you just have say a 3D multigrid computation where you want a three-dimensional array and because as I said you, you, C has fairly weak multi-dimensional arrays you, you probably will want to implement it like this we call these um, within the UPC the Berkeley UPC group, uh, a directory style implementation of a data structure. OK, so what are we going to do? Well, we're going to build um, a little array still, of a shared array that's going to hold onto a set of pointers. That's really going to be our directory. And so there's our directory, um, and it was just a, uh, a shared um, array of double pointers. and. Um, uh, pointers to two arrays. And then we're going to allocate locally each processor, each thread is going to execute this, because it's all SPIMD code, um, that uh, it's going to do a UPC all alloc. And so it's allocating a chunk of memory, which could be, for example, one row of an array. It could be two rows of an array. It could be a three-dimensional block that's a subcube of an array. And you can then um, tie them all together by uh, because they, they can all the threads can then get to any other element in the array by going through that um, shared data structure. So um, you can use these all those arrays that are allocated there. So let me just go back for a second, make it clear what I'm pointing to. Do not have to be the same size. Um, so if you've got say a sparse matrix and you want to have a list of a row of, of an array of rows um, and those row lengths are different, you can use this kind of a data structure for that. Um, and they can also be used for things that are, um, say, multidimensional. What I would do for, say, a 3D array is make a directory that's a 3D array. Um, and actually, probably what I would do is make it, um, so I'd replicate the directory. And every processor would have a copy of a little 3D array that points to the blocks that are owned by each of the other processors. Now, you do have me memory overhead when you do that. And if you don't want to, to store the number of pointers that is equal to the number of processors in your system, you can build something more hierarchical. You can say, I want an, a three-dimensional array that points to, you know, say, a subregion of the machine. And there is stored a directory for all of the, the pieces of the array that are stored in that part of the machine. So it's very flexible. And you can get um, whatever kind of a, a data structure you really want in order to get the kind of locality access and uh, performance that you want out of the system. Okay, so you really have very good control over performance. Um, there's nothing magic happening for you, right? The compiler, um, and I'll say a little bit about the compiler, but a compiler for UPC is actually a very simple compiler other than just being a C compiler. It's got a little bit of other stuff in it and, uh, and a runtime system that I'll talk about, but it's much simpler uh, runtime system, for example, than the Charm++ one. It's really just kind of trying to expose to you what the hardware is doing. Yes? Uh, for the often communication, what libraries is it typically built on? It's built on top of, typically on GasNet, which is our own uh, one-sided communication library that's been around for a long time and runs on basically every HPC system as well as uh, Ethernet networks and uh, InfiniBand networks and so on. And it's optimized for the one-sided case. Um, so. We use this for um, also for building more complicated data structures. This is really a motivating example um, that will kind of lead into the UPC++ discussion. It's from a language that I worked on for a number of years called Titanium. Perhaps a, an idea before its time, um, it was a, a high performance language based on Java rather than being based on C++ or C. And, um, it had these nice sort of domains that you could use. So you can declare an array that lives in a global, global index space. 
Um, and so each array can start and end at a different index. Um, so for something like an adaptive mesh refinement code, um, you can very easily copy the ghost regions, even though you have this, this patchwork of blocks sitting all over in your logical domain, by just saying, pick up two, any, any two blocks in the system and do a copy operation on them. And that will fill in the places where those index spaces um, intersect. They're, the domain library, or the domain abstraction, is very similar to um, what's in Chapel that, that Brad talked about as well. And from a productivity standpoint, I actually think that these higher level arrays are one of the most important things to have in the language for scientific code that's multi that's based on multi-dimensional arrays it's just you know a lot of the errors have to do with tedious things like index calculations and in fact in my experience over the years what you know with different students and postdocs and so on writing par parallel applications, um, we had one race condition, and we've had many, many index errors, and many of which took months to find, because if you got an off by one error some somewhere inside of an adaptive mesh refinement calculation, you know, you only see it because the colors in the visualization are a little bit off for a while. I mean, sometimes it'll blow up, and sometimes it just will be just a little bit wrong for a very long time, so. Yes. I have one question regarding this. So uh, some of the topologies actually the indices are going to be are going to have a mapping. So actually, you might have them running differently. Uh, how do you account for that kind of situation? So are you talking about like the question was about having indices? The topology, they actually like the local index maps differently in order with the neighboring block. So in this case, for example, you might have I in this direction, J in the other direction, and the next block might also have the same orientation, but it might be the case that actually the orientation changes, and you might map a J index with an I index and the right. I index with the J index. So they might run in different directions. So what, one of the things that you can do in Titanium, and that we've actually just ported to UPC++, is you can do a, a I'm trying to remember, I think it's called a translate, which is a, kind of a logical flip of the array into another, um, in, into a different orientation. So that's what I would do in that case, is I would flip it so that they are actually aligned in the same orientation. That does not move any data in the, in the actual state of the, the array. No, it just, the that's right, it just, it messes around with the metadata. And by the way, it doesn't, it also doesn't change the original data structure. What you do is you say, you know, B is equal to A translated in this particular way or, or um, rotated in this, this particular way. So yes, you can, you can do those kind of transforms. And those things are really powerful, right, for um, just not having, I, the way I think of it is um, you could implement that in a library just as we can implement in a library. But it's really nice for one person or one group of people to get all the errors out of that code because it's really nasty kind of code to get, get all your indices is right. Okay. So a little bit about UPC and the implementation. Um, I think I might not have the slide in here that says that there are many different um, compilers, but there are, um, there are a number of different compilers. There's a Cray um, compiler that is a you know, supported product from Cray. Um, there are also compilers. Uh, there's a compiler from IBM, although I think it's not a, not, not a supported product on the uh, BlueGene machine, but you'll see some published results from the BlueGene. Um, and our compiler, which is a source-to-source um, -source translator. So the way this works is you take in, we take in UPC code and we spit out C code with calls to our library. And the reason was because we are, um, you know, kind of, a, we're a research project. We did a lot of research over the years on doing compiler optimizations in UPC, all of which could be done at the source level, that is, by doing, generating different C code and different runtime code. And so we get a lot of portability out of this. Um, and so what it means is that our, our UPC compiler runs on basically any platform. And in fact, we do have an implementation that runs on MPI for the, for the, the, the communication. Um, it is not a well-optimized implementation of MPI. It's not using the latest features of MPI, like the one-sided features, but because um, it was built quite a, uh, it was built before MPI got the new modern um, one-sided features. But um, it does give you kind of immediate portability, including if you want to run on top of UDP on Ethernet. Um, so the, the vendors um, that ha that have their own compilers can give you much better. Um, much more integrated optimizations and things like that between the node code that's running on a single processor core or multi-core system and also um, and with the, the communication. Um, and so there are a number of compilers that do that. There is also another open source compiler besides the Berkeley compiler, which is the GCC-based compiler from Intrepid. And that one is it also generates machine code by using GCC. Um, and some of this stuff has been integrated back into into that plat that standard, uh, is, they're moving it back into the trunk of GCC. 
There's some new stuff in um, the latest version of UPC. It's called UPC version 1.3. Um, and uh, it's, this has come from actually features that we've had in the Berkeley compiler for many years, which is um, the ability to do overlap of communication, both with other co communication and with computation um, for bulk operations. So these are, so UPC has always had um, the kinds of features that are in C, like mem copy, copy um, for copying bulk data operations, which for those of you who have done kind of high performance programming just in C, you know that it's much faster to do a mem copy than it is to write a loop that copies a element at a time. And so this is the, the analogous thing. It is, um, it is a, a non-blocking mem copy, um, and then you, you separately sync it. So you can say, initiate this mem copy operation. So it's like a DMA operation, if you're familiar with direct memory access, um, kind of with the way hardware works, and it's going to do this copy operation. Um, there are also puts and gets, and there's other ways of synchronizing it. But um, basically, you initiate the put um, and the, uh, or the mem copy or whatever, and you later then come back and synchronize it. So this feature, we're, we're happy that it's finally in um, the standard UPC because we've been using it for a long time um, in things like a 3D FFT. And this is the example that I referred to earlier that show, shows how really lightweight one-sided communication can be very effective um, even if you've got a bulk synchronous problem if you want to move a lot of data around the system. And the, the real issue here is your ability to overlap communication and computation and, um, and to send sometimes smaller messages rather than being forced to send larger messages because the overhead of each message is too high. So in a 3D FFT, what you're doing is FFTs on the columns, FFTs on the rows, and then FFTs into and out of the, the uh, projector, the screen there. Um, and so what we'll do is, in this, this particular version I'm just showing, uh, that we divided it up with a plane sitting on each one of the processors. And um, each processor is going to do, say, the columns first, then it's going to do the rows, and then it's going to send a chunk of its data to another processor that will then own, say, the top slab there um, to do the FFTs in the third dimension. So there are three different kind of general ways you could think about doing the communication. Um, the, the way I think most well-trained MPI programmers would do this is to say, well, let me get the maximum possible block size. Um, so I'll wait until, if this processor owns four planes of, of this array, I'll wait until I'm done with um, all of the four, um, the four rows in the four planes, pack them together contiguously if they're not already packed that way, and then ship them as a single message. And so you're actually going to wait for all of the FFTs to be done and then pack everything together because you're, you're doing it. Um, that, that would be sort of a bulk synchronous style. We call that chunk. Um, the other thing you do is just say, well, wait for just one contiguous plane of the FFTs to be finished and then send it. So that's just waiting for, say, four rows. Um, or you could say, well, let's just wait for one row. As soon as I finish one row of the FFT, I'm going to just send that row off to the processor that it's going to belong to. Um, later. And that one has the most messages. All of these send the same volume of memory, of, of data around the system, but they have very different numbers of message counts. Um, so the first, the chunk has the, has the minimum number of messages, and the pencil has the largest number of messages. But pencil also has the, the highest opportunity for overlap, because you can start sending that pencil as soon as you've done one row FFT. Um, so let's see. In this particular version, some machines, the pencil one actually wins um, over the slab one. In this particular case, I guess the, the slab, and this is on Blue Gene P, um, the slab implementation it was the optimal one in UPC. And um, the MPI version that was doing packed slabs um, is, you can see, a little bit slower. This is gigaflop, so, so up is good. So you have, you have lower overhead. Um, these numbers don't always look the same. We get sometimes uh, better performance, sometimes worse performance than MPI, and it depends a lot on the kind of the low-level communication layer. But there are real opportunities for more overlap, because on a, a lot of these hardware systems, the lowest level hardware mechanism for doing communication is a DMA operation. That is, take some data and put it over there. And so I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute, but that's really what what UPC is exposing to you. And so the point is, even on 32,000 cores, you know, we're, we're at least very competitive with, um, with MPI performance. Um, UPC 1.3 also has atomic operations. This is kind of uh, something I'll talk a little bit more about when I get to UPC++. But um, rather than having a lock, update, unlock, you have the ability to do um, an atomic operation as a single operation. There's a limited set of atomics. Atomics have been a topic of discussion in the UPC standards group uh, 
uh, for uh, our specification group, I should say, for many years. But um, the problem has been figuring out what the vendors will support in terms of being able to do an atomic operation in the network interface. Because what you would really like to do is, let's say you're doing an atomic ad, you send some data over to the other pro side and you want the network interface, not the main CPU on the other side to do that ad for you. And um, so they, you know, some, some different processors are going to do, give you different kinds of support um, in terms of exactly how, which ones are really fast um, at the hardware level. This is something that hopefully the, the, we can get a little bit more consistency across the vendors um, in the next generation networks. So what's a, a, an ex example of a real application written in UPC? Um, and one of them is uh, some, some work that's ongoing at Berkeley on a um, genome assembly program called Miraculous. Um, so it's a genome assembly pipeline. And what it's doing is it's taking in all these short reads. You've got little Xs, those are errors. And you've got um, these markers, which I'm not going to really talk about here, which are the red things. So first of all, we make the I.O. go a lot faster um, and things like that in, in processing these things. What, you're, what we're doing is we're throwing out the errors by chopping them in, into even smaller pieces called Kmers. Um, these are like, say, 50, 51 base pairs long, just little short pieces of the sequence. And then if, if something doesn't occur with a high enough frequency, you throw it out, say it was probably an error. Um, you, by the way, you read over and over again, so you get multiple um, reads of the, any, any particular thing that's actually in the genome. And then we do some analysis on this um, uh, using a data structure called a bloom filter. Um, this is like a hash table, a multiple hash tables kind of all glued together. And it's a great way, of, it's, a, it's a probabilistic data structure. And what happens is you, um, you, you, ha use ha you hash using, say, three different functions. You put any item in three different places in the hash table. Um, and so when you look it up, um, you, can, you look it up in those three places. And if you see it, um, then it's likely that it's in the hash table. If you don't see it, you're guaranteed that it's not in the hash table. But um, for in this particular case, what you're trying to do is eliminate these errors, and that kind of a probabilistic data structure is just fine. Um, and then the hardest part in terms of scalability, so all of this was uh, code that, could, that was being done in parallel before in Miraculous, which is a production assembler used um, in the Joint Genome Institute at Berkeley. Um, the, the Contig generation is where you're going to try to glue these pieces together. And it's using an algorithm um, based on something called De Bruyne um, graphs. And you're basically trying to glue these pieces together. The basic operation is um, put all of these cameras into a hash table, and then look them up again. And, and e in each case, pull one out and try to figure out what the next character is. We've got a certain way of filtering them that we know exactly what the next character is in the sequence, and then look that up in the hash table and glue that together. And so what you need is the ability to access a really enormous hash table and um, doing random access. And so this is kind of a canonical PGAS sort of application. Um, this algorithm before was implemented sequentially using um, just running on a bit, you know, you'd buy a big fat shared memory machine, although as I recall, they're not even using, they weren't using the threads, they were just using, you know, all the memory they could get um, on the machine to do this, because to try to fit the, uh, um, the whole genome uh, into, into a single shared memory space. So now we run it up on the Edison machine, for example, up to 15,000 cores, um, and it scales very well. And it doesn't require the special shared memory hardware. Now, there is some other work we have to do to finish the pipeline, although we can we've used the old ver existing version of the code in Miraculous to, to be able to complete the pipeline and actually get the genome assembled. assembled. Um, the human genome. Just we used as a benchmark, um, used to take 44 hours and now takes 20 seconds. Uh, the wheat genome didn't run before, or they, at least there's some discussion about whether it couldn't run because they didn't have enough memory or just they just never ran it because it would have taken so long, um, but it now runs in 32 seconds. And um, so, you know, this, this wheat genome is actually a grand challenge problem because to my surprise, maybe you heard this last night at dinner, wheat, the wheat's genome is much more complicated than the human genome. So um, there's a, you're able to get a, a new result from this a new, new assembly of the wheat genome. Um, this kind of a kind of random access into a global address space, but using more interesting operations than just read or write, also comes up in the kind of model that um, Sanjay talked about, which is an event driven execution model. And I didn't talk about this in the Pi example, but um, a number of years ago, Perry Husbands um, did some work uh, building a, an event-driven execution for an LU factorization code that was built um, on top of UPC. And this is one of the inspirations for UPC++ um, is to be able to do this. The idea is in we're factoring a matrix here. This is dense LU factorization, although the goal of that project is that was actually sparse matrix factorization. Um, and uh, 
but this, in this particular case, the, the idea is rather than, say, factoring a column, having a barrier, and then doing a trailing matrix update, you just say, well, all of these blocks have particular dependencies and when those, the tasks on those blocks can execute. Um, we are going to decide ahead of, uh, ahead of time, and this is unlike charm++, plus plus, we're going to lay out our matrix in a block cyclic way, manner, and we're going to decide exactly where every task is going to execute based on um, what the layout of that matrix is. So for example, all the little red things are living on the same processor. Um, so the layout is, is fixed, and the assignment of work to processors uh, to, you know, to processors or threads is fixed. Um, but what's variable is exactly when are they going to run. And they're going to run whenever the data is ready for them to run. And so that's what makes it an event-driven execution. And this way, you, we've kind of decoupled the question of when things run from the question of where things run. Programmers control where things run. The runtime system, in this case, I mean, built on top of this, controls when they run. And there's a paper on this if you want to read more about it. OK, so what is this UPC++ thing? Um, I, what, so let's see, I guess about um, 17 years ago when uh, my daughter was born and the UPC project started <laughs> at the same time, uh, we, people were already asking, what about UPC++? And Bill Carlson and I um, were, we got that question a lot. And, and we always said, yuck, we don't want to write a UPC, uh, we don't want to write a C++ compiler because it's such a nightmare. And we actually started the Titanium project with the intent of building a C++ version of UPC. Um, and. Uh, uh, that, that student that first built the, the first compiler uh, left Berkeley and went to MIT, so we decided that was not a good strategy for keeping students um, in the program. So we, um, we decided to go ahead and uh, to not build a C++ compiler. And it's really hard. Um, there are only a few of these C++ front ends around. So for those of you who are, know anything about the way the compiler community works, there's one from a, a company called Edison Design Group. And most of the uh, companies that have a C++ compiler license the front end from Edison Design Group. And EDG actually does have UPC features um, in it, so um, but it's still you know just kind of building a compiler for this thing is is kind of a nightmare. So our UPC++ strategy is not does not involve a compiler; it's just um, libraries and templates. Um, it's part of a larger project called Dega. I won't try to say everything that's on this slide, but you're certainly welcome to look our, at our, our web pages. Um, and there's a lot of other things in Dega and resilience and um, the, the runtime system and things like that that are not, um, not just UPC, but U, or UPC++. So what's the idea in UPC++? Well, we're taking kind of PGAS style things that I've talked about, which originally had a SPMD model of execution, in, at least in UPC, um, but this global address space, and DAG computations, where you've got some DAG of dependent tasks that you want to execute. Um, so you maybe you have dynamic load balancing you want to do, and you want to put those two things together. And so in the Dega project, um, you're going to get that. So just to give you a little flavor of UPC++, um, it's generic programming in a PGAS context, or maybe PGAS in a generic programming context. You got modern language features, uh, meaning you've got you've got C++ language features for things like classes and inheritance and so on. Um, and you can interoperate with MPI, OpenMP, CUDA, et cetera. Actually, the original kind of tr reason that we got involved in the UPC++ was because we were trying to merge CUDA with UPC. And because CUDA was based on C++, it was just awkward to do that. You can call out from UPC to Fortran or to C++, but it's kind of nasty um, you know, cross-language programming, especially when you go to, UP go to C++. And so um, we started this effort to try to support the, uh, the CUDA machines that had uh, GPUs, NVIDIA GPUs on them. So UPC++ uses templates. So the syntax is not nearly as nice as in UPC, which I can't say is beautiful syntax either, but it certainly gets a little bit uglier in UPC++. But you can get your shared scalars, and you can still get shared, shared arrays and things like that. Um, and things look a little bit more explicit, so you don't have quite as much um, you know, convenient syntax. But, you, but we've also added a new feature that's not in UPC, which is a remote procedure call. So it's an async operation um, that will very much like what's in um, the C++ the C++ 11 um, spec also is in a language like um, X10 and so on. So can you have also derived objects uh, to actually be part, like a class? Can you put any class over there? Yes, yes. Uh, oh, in the, yes, in the shared thing? Yes, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, so let's see. There's some parts of this. This language is still under development, and the question of exactly how, you know, some of the remote invocation on when you've got a, a um, yeah, when you've got a shared object and you've got a, a 
class there, it becomes a little bit complicated to figure out what. So what's the question? The question is, um, when you've got a pointer to a user-defined type, um, at where does that method run? And so the, the kind of standard answer in UPC is the, it, um, the method runs wherever you call the method. It doesn't move over someplace else because the object is there. So that's kind of the easiest thing to implement is just go and suck the this object across the network and execute wherever you're running locally. But then the, the async will put it on, it explicitly says the programmer wants to run it over there. And so everything always runs locally unless you say otherwise. So what is it going to use to actually grab the whole object? Um, it will just do a, a copy operation. So this is, you know, it may not get, if, if you don't have the... Um, the uh, Derived data type or something like for... No, not yet. Yeah, but the, I would be happy to talk about that because, yes, we're still, we're still working on that, those parts of the, the design. Yeah. Um, okay, so the um, GUPS, let's see, the, which is this random access example that I mentioned before, um, this is just showing that UPC++ is only a little bit slower than UPC. Um, and it does scale. There's, there's the shared memory style running on, or shared memory implementation running on mic. So, so shared memory implementation of the, the compiled code, if you will. That's it, the UPC versus UPC++ code. So it's a little bit slower because you don't have compiler support and uh, for, for translating things. So there's a little bit of overhead that's added. Um, when you get to a large machine, you really don't notice the difference because it's all about communication at that point. Um, and so that's running on, like I guess it's 8K eight, eight cores of a uh, blue gene of the Mira system, I think. Okay, so let's see. Um, I think that I'll just say a little bit more about the one-sided versus two-sided um, communication. So what you're getting from PGAS is, um, is really a one-sided put operation. And this is not intended to say anything about um, MPI's one-sided. This is just kind of telling you uh, historically where the, the PGAS um, idea came from was the ability to, um, to do a one-sided operation. And the difference between, say, a two-sided MPI send and receive operation and a one-sided, say, put message in, um, in, in UPC is that in the implementation, what you've got in the put message is an address and some data. And that message goes across the network and a network interface that's worth its salt, basically anything other than maybe Ethernet, is going to be able to pick that message up, look at the data, and write it into the final location in memory. Whereas in an MPI two-sided um, protocol, what you're sending is a, is a message ID and the data. So what happens has to happen on the other side is it has to find out where does that data go. And the information about where the data go, it goes is in the receive operation. It's not in the send operation. So it has to find the matching receive and figure out where that data should go, and then it can write it in memory. And, you know, good implementations of uh, applications will pre-post receives. Good implementations of MPI will take advantage of that and try to, you know, and give you good performance out of this. But fundamentally, um, what MPI is also giving you, which is an advantage, is it's synchronizing for you. It's saying you know that the data, when you say receive, that the data has been received. I mean, depending on what kind of receive you're using. A one-sided put, the data goes across the network, it gets written in memory. It's your job as a programmer to worry about how do I know when that data has been has completed. And so, you know, it's for different styles of programming, I think these two different models are useful. Um, the ability to kind of push data out into the network is much better if you're just doing a put operation, you're not doing matching, and you're not doing synchronization. This is showing the performance of um, Cray's UPC implementation, Berkeley's UPC implementation. We were doing something weird with a switchover point there at I think that's 4K message sizes. Um, so Craze was much faster at that one point, and um, and MPI, which was sig significantly slower. And so both of those were implemented by the the two Cray ones are implemented by Cray. So this is not just the Berkeley people, you know, saying the Berkeley implementation is uh, is better or something than than a bad MPI implementation. Obviously, Cray puts a lot of effort into its MPI implementation as well as its UPC implementation. Um, this is just some benchmark numbers showing that um, when you compare some of the standard um, uh, the NAS parallel benchmarks and across a couple of different size machines that you sometimes, this is the percentage speed up of UPC over MPI for these implementations. And so FFT gives you a big advantage. SP, there's a big advantage. Sometimes we do run slower um, on uh, and a couple of the, of the things there, but, but mostly we're, we're doing, doing pretty well. Um, the point of this is there, again, not to say, you know, UPC is always faster or anything like that, but that you can get very good and scalable performance out of it. Um, and if you really work on tuning it, you can often um, get a, a faster implementation than, um, than a two-sided MPI. Okay, so a couple of other examples of applications, and then I'll, I'll wrap up. But um, this is... Uh, Another problem that we're seeing a lot in 
in parallel applications is the desire to integrate observational data into a simulation in some way. And so this kind of a data fusion problem, if you will, um, although it's really fusion kind of in real time in the middle of the simulation, comes up in this seismic analysis or seismic simulation problem. Uh, the basic problem is you've got this seismic simulation, you've got this observational data, they're in completely different layouts and you want to put them together in a big distributed matrix, it has to be distributed because it's too big to fit in the no, uh, in any one memory's uh, node. And so this is done uh, by using the P PGAS, address, uh, PGAS programming model. It was actually done using UPC++ and a distributed array implementation on UPC++. And um, the other important thing to know about this is it was actually an MPI Fortran code that calls Scalapack and various other libraries. Um, and just this one piece of then th this then is written in UPC++. Actually, I think it was, yeah, I think it was C++ code that was calling Fortran. Um, here's a mini GMG benchmark, which is a, a multi-grid um, calculation. And this is showing that we, we now have the multi-dimensional array library that's been put into UPC++ that came from Titanium. We actually ported the, the entire code um, to UPC++, so it's accessible from there. Um, that array library gives you much higher level access. Uh, we have not yet quite caught up with the bulk implementation um, of the uh, uh, communication, but we, so we, what you're seeing here is four implementations, the MPI implementation, um, which is the fastest, the um, bulk implementation in UPC++, which is actually equivalent to the MPI, and then the array version, which is much more elegant because you're just, say, copying blocks of arrays, but we haven't quite caught up with the bulk performance, and then a really fine-grained one, which is significantly slower. Um, we're also using the PGAS ideas inside of, or they, they are used inside of NW Chem, which is a very popular um, chemistry application. And um, I'll just say we're, we have a new implementation of that runtime layer that's on top of GasNet, which is our, our level, low level communication layer have Lulesh and some other kinds of things. What we're looking at now is more hierarchical PGAS. And um, I'll just say that um, the idea, what I've, what I've talked about a little bit here is um, kind of dynamic threading models, event-driven execution. We actually have dynamic task queue library in C that you can use if you want to do dynamic load balancing. A hierarchical version of PGAS, though, says that I can take a subset of the processors and I can treat them as, say, a data parallel program uh, machine and do a lot of collective operations. I could take another set and have dynamic load balancing happens happening. And that is useful if you've got hierarchical applications or hierarchical machines. So I think that what Brad talked about was a very similar kind of motivation, but was coming from a dynamic parallelism creation idea that you, you start with your computation, you know, say on locale zero, and then it kind of spreads out from there. Um, what you see in UPC++ is you start a computation on every one of your cores, for example, and then you um, and then you group them together. You say, "Give me all the cores that are on my node, and let's do dynamic load balancing there, or um, you know some other uh, group of processors, maybe all the cores that are in a single cabinet or something like that." So with that, um, since I think I'm out of time, I will um, just thank all of the collaborators that have been involved for many years. Um, and hopefully I've got most of their names on this list and see if there are any questions about either UPC, UPC++, or Dega. Yes. Uh, how does UP, UPC compare with uh, uh, Core and Fortran? Um, so UPC and Coray Fortran were really designed in parallel kind of at the same time. And there's a lot of cross fertilization of ideas between the two. The biggest difference is UPC is based on C and Coray Fortran is based on Fortran. Um, the, the difference, in, and there is, by the way, a version that Cray has a, a, a language call, that they call Coray C++. And so there you can see kind of the more interesting um, semantic differences between the two languages. Um, and the difference is that in Coray Fortran, you have a co-dimension, right? So you've got your array, at least in the simplest version, the way to think about it is you've got a distributed array, and one of the dimensions is the dimension that's spread around the processors, and the other dimensions are local to the processor. UPC does not take a, uh, um, so, so you can always get that kind of an implementation in UPC by saying the first dimension, for example, is threads, and then the others are whatever they are, and you would get something that's, that's mapped around in that particular way. Um, but, you, uh, but you have to think about it a little bit more in, um, in UPC in terms of exactly what the layout is doing. On the other hand, the layout is much more flexible, um, so you could have it, it spread out in any different way. And, and as I said, for the real applications for us, I mean, part of this is because C doesn't have very good multidimensional arrays, but we use these directory data structures and they get very irregular data structure layouts. And how, can, you, can you tell some numbers like in terms of performance at large scale, maybe like? 
you know, uh, so, so John Miller Crummy years ago wrote a paper about this, which I objected to vehemently. <laughs> um, they, they did multi-grid, and they, that was the one application where uh, Coray Fortran outperformed C and the re UPC. And the reason was the Fortran compiler, believe it or not, Fortran compilers are still better at compiling multi-dimensional array code than C compilers are. And that was the whole thing. So we then we his group and my group, we both went off and tried to optimize them and tried to figure out, you know, whether we could we, could we trick the C compiler into actually generating good quality multi-dimensional array code. So we're now working on some work in the part of the Dega project to do specialization and do auto-tuning and stuff like that to get good multi multi-dimensional array code. But otherwise is Coray Fortran runs on top of GasNet. There's really no fundamental difference in the scalability. Any other questions?